it's it's interesting that um, Jaden called me a guest. I feel like this is my home, at least. Uh, you guys are my people. Um, so it's a little it's a little challenging preaching in front of my people. I would rather be preaching somewhere like Peru, uh, where there's uh, two interpreters, where it's not Spanish, but Awahoon, like another language, where you have to uh, say something and then wait like five seconds for uh, the point to be like translated into the language. Um, so, but I'm, I'm extremely happy and joyful to be here, um, to be in the presence of my own home. And so I ask that you wouldn't listen to me today, but you would listen to God. Um, listen to what he has to say. He's laid something uh, on my heart that um, I pray that I communicate effectively to you. Um, I pray that you would uh, really uh, search your heart and ask yourself, am I a follower of Christ? And if I am, what am I doing? Am I just going to sit there in the pew? Or am I actually going to live out this gospel? So if you have a Bible, and I hope you do, uh, open up to Romans chapter 10. And we're really going to be focusing on three key verses. Romans chapter 10, and we'll start in verse 13. It says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. How beautiful. Beauty. I want you to imagine uh, the most beautiful thing that you've ever experienced. Um, it could be maybe a, a mountain in Colorado. I've, I've probably experienced the most beautiful mountain in uh, Switzerland. Uh, it was this massive mountain, and you could see the, the clouds um, covering the mountain. It was so high, and, and the, there, it was snow-capped. There was snow on top of the mountain. It was beautiful, and the, the trees on the mountain were so green, and the, the grass, it was, it was the greenest grass I've ever experienced in my life. Or for you, it could be maybe, uh, maybe the sound of the ocean. Uh, we have some beachgoers in here that, that enjoy going to the, the beach. And so you can hear the waves crashing into each other. Maybe it could be, uh, there may be some artists. <laughs> I'm definitely not... <laughs> An artist. Um, we tried. We went to Tino's palette a couple of years ago, and we were painting a picture. And mine was so bad that Amanda started painting on mine. So <laughs> I'm not an artist, but maybe for you it could be art. Maybe you just I uh, have like a, a a picture of art that you really enjoy looking at. And maybe you can. Um, Maybe that's like the most beautiful thing. Maybe it could be uh, a musical piece. Maybe there's someone in here that loves music. And so listening to uh, maybe a, an opera or classical music, Mozart, Beethoven, maybe that's the most beautiful sound that you've ever heard. There are two key moments in my life that I would consider the most beautiful events. The first... July 11th, and um, I can remember I was standing uh, at the, the altar with Pastor Adam Mast, and I was waiting for the doors to open and my bride to walk down the aisle. I wanted to make it a raw moment. Uh, nowadays, people often do 
like the whole first look, which is awesome. They save time where the, the bride and the groom, they go into a separate room and uh, they see each other before the wedding. It's, it's also really good because they have like an, an intimate moment. That's the very first time that they see each other that day. Um, and they, they capture uh, the moment with, with pictures and often the, the groom starts crying. It's a very emotional experience. I told myself that day I was not going to cry. I said, Chase, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. And I remember standing there, and uh, Adam told everybody to stand like normal. Amanda came, walked down the aisle, and I gasped for air. It's like... <gasps> I can remember the <laughs> the people on the on the couple front rows. They they stopped and they looked at me. They're like, "What's he gonna do? Is he gonna break down and cry?" I didn't. I just gasped for air. I didn't cry. It was the most beautiful. I was in shock of how beautiful that moment was. How beautiful Amanda was when when her and her dad came and walked down the aisle. I was in shock. Took everything that I had not to cry. It was so emotional. The second moment of my life was in January of this year. <laughs> oh man, it was a crazy day. I could go on and on and on and tell you like the details of the story and tell you what happened, but I can remember the day that my firstborn son was born. And I remember I uh, held him. And I have a nephew that's nine months older than him, and I can remember uh, holding him, not when he was like a newborn, but he was about a month old the first time, and I held him, and I was, everybody was making fun of me because like I was, I was shaking, I, I didn't know really how to hold him, I was awkwardly, you know, like, I don't know what to do, but with Lincoln it was different. God took all that fear away, and I was just caught up in this moment of this precious child. I was looking at him in the eyes, and I could hear his soft little cry. It was so beautiful, this beautiful moment. I was so just in shock of the, the beauty I was witnessing. My first point is that the gospel is beautiful. The gospel is beautiful. It's the most beautiful thing that we can ever experience but we are not beautiful. We're not beautiful. It's often said that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Right? I'm, like I said earlier, I'm not very artistic. Those that are able to view a painting and see the beauty that I cannot see or hear a piece of music and point out the beauty that's heard that I, I can't hear. I can't hear it. God views our going as beautiful. God views our going as beautiful. How beautiful are the feet that bring the good news. Feet are not very beautiful. They're pretty ugly. Very ugly. When Paul was writing his letter... Sandals were often worn. People traveled a long distance walking in sandals. I can just picture these sandals being very nasty and ugly and smelly and gross. They didn't have nice tennis shoes and socks to cover up the nastiness of their feet. In Uganda, while I was working with refugees, I can remember experiencing moments like that where feet were extremely nasty. Most of the kids were running around playing soccer barefoot. These rocks, it was, I mean, their feet were gross. You could really see the nastiness of their feet. But I, I was wearing tennis shoes. My feet, they were probably really smelly. But, it, I mean, I had something to cover it up. I can remember being in the, oh, probably the first or second grade, a little kid, and for some reason, 
I decided I wasn't going to wear socks with my shoes. Man, my feet smelled terrible after that. Horrible. Horrible. Today in America, uh, here in Oklahoma especially, the main motive of, of travel is by car, right? So we're not just walking hundreds of miles every day like they did thousands of years ago. We have a nice car. But you can really tell where the car has been based off of two things, based off of the floor mats in the car, the floorboards in the car, and the windshield. You can really tell if I have drove uh, a lot of places with a lot of bugs on my windshield. It's nasty. It's gross. I got to uh, go to the, um, the gas station, wipe off the bugs. It's just, it's nasty, uh, especially the floorboards. Um, I love to go hunting. I love to, to go hunting. A lot of the places that I go are really muddy, really nasty. Um, and so I, I get in. And the day after, um, you can really tell that I've been hunting because, I mean, my floorboards in my car are covered in mud. It's just, I mean, it's muddy. It's gross. It's evident that I've walked through some mud. The gospel is beautiful. God views it as beautiful. We're not the ones that are beautiful. My second point. Spreading the gospel is not beautiful in the eyes of the world. It's not. Ministry occurs beyond the walls of the church. If, if you're sitting in here today and you think that the ministry happens inside of the church, I would say you're, you're probably wrong. It happens outside the walls of the church. And let me tell you, it's not pretty. You're going to walk in some places that are muddy. You're going to go to some places that make you feel uncomfortable. It's gross sometimes. Now, I'm not saying that those people that we minister to or have the opportunity to minister to, or you may be in this room today and you may be one of those people that are lost. I'm not saying that you're gross. But I'm saying that, that the enemy is the one that makes it gross. There's suffering. There's diseases. There's COVID, right? It's not Jesus. It's the enemy. The enemy makes it nasty. But we are called to be the light into the world, to go. The enemy does not want us to share the gospel. We must get our feet nasty in order to proclaim the gospel. While the world may view the outward appearance, outward appearance of the man, God views the inward appearance. He views our heart. That's what's beautiful. In fact, when God views us, he doesn't view our righteousness at all. He doesn't. He views his son's obedience. Scripture tells us there is no one righteous, not one. We can't do anything to try to make our going beautiful. It's only through Christ. Only through his blood that we're considered beautiful as we go. My third point. Our feet are to bring the good news. Why are feet? We have to pause. Why does it say how beautiful are the feet? Why not hands? Why doesn't it say how beautiful are the hands? that bring the good news. We, we could bring the good news with our hands, right? It'd probably be a, a little less nastier. Our hands, I mean, we have time to wash them, you know? I mean, we, we wash our hands all the time. Right? How 
However, we have no physical gift to bring. It's not our good news at all. It's not our gift. It's his. It's his gift. Hands are meant for building. His kingdom has already been built. His kingdom has already been built. He has all authority in heaven and on earth. It is finished. We're to go. But let me pause. Let me slow down. We must stop and think. What is the good news? You you may be sitting here today not knowing what this good news is. You maybe have uh, come to church. Um, you may know of, of church, churchy things, right? But let me tell you this good news. Let me tell you, because this could be the very first time that you ever hear this. This is the good news. We are doomed to sin. What is sin? Sin is disobeying God. We are all sinners. We are all doomed to sin. You may be saying, that's not very good news. (laughs) Right? That's really bad news. But this is the good news. The good news is that God sent his son who lived the perfect life to die in our place so that we may have the opportunity to be with him forever, for eternity. This is the good news. This is the best news. those that bring the good news. God uses people to proclaim the good news. He uses people. Isn't that crazy? How beautiful are the feet of those, those who bring the good news. Those people. We are the means through which this mission has to be accomplished. As we see in uh, the early part of Romans, Romans 1, 20, it says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen. There's, I mean, it is evident that God made the world. Scripture tells us that the mountains cry out. God, they cry out, looking up at the stars, Uh, In western Oklahoma, it is evident that someone placed them there. It is evident. These qualities have been seen, but it is the hearing that saves people. Jesus performed many miracles, right? People saw these miracles. They didn't believe. Even in the Old Testament, I've been reading through Exodus. Pharaoh saw a lot of, um, a lot of like miraculous things happen. Just didn't believe. God says that his heart was hardened. People often say that, well, if God would show me a sign, I would believe. Although nature cries out, God, we are the instrument that God uses to point people to Christ. We are the instrument. Let us proclaim the gospel. Point number four. We are commanded to share the gospel. We're commanded. Great Commission is not just for pastors. It's not. It's not just for Stephen. It's for you. It's for 
followers of Christ. The command is go. If you're a follower of Christ and you're not sharing the gospel, why are you sitting here? Go! I urge you. I urge you. The gospel must be proclaimed. It's beautiful. There are people here that are dying that have never heard of Jesus. They've never heard of Jesus. Here, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'm, I'm not saying they've never heard of church. There's a church on every single corner. There's actually more than one church on every single corner. You can almost you can almost throw a rock and you'll hit another church. It's like quick trip. People have heard of church. But people really haven't heard of Jesus. Those people inside those churches aren't sharing about Jesus. They may have like heard the name of Jesus. There's a lot of little J Jesuses running around that people talk about. But there's only one Jesus that can set them free. There is. There's only one Jesus that can give them life. Why, Christ follower, are you not doing something about this? It's estimated, I've said this before, that 3.2 billion, that's not million, billion people have never heard of the gospel. Think about that. We're sitting here in this church and I am proclaiming the gospel and freely to you, but 3.2 billion people out there have never heard the gospel. They're unreached. Without proclaiming the gospel, they will die and be separated from God for eternity. Why are we not moving? Why are we not moving? We have to have a sense of urgency. Why are we coming to church every Sunday and not doing ministry outside the walls of this building? This is God's redemptive plan. God sends the one that is sent preaches I'm not saying up here preaches a preacher is like a town crier hearie hearie I have news that's what the word preach means the preacher is sent to those that hear those that hear believe how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Imagine. So if you're trying to, to call, if you don't have a number, to call, let, let's say, um, someone like for an emergency, but you don't have that number. You can't call unless you have their number, right? I, I, can't, I can't call you unless I don't have your number. Well, how do you get the number? It's with hearing the number, right? Well, how do you hear the number? It's... Uh, from someone that gives you the number. The person tells them. And how do they know that person? They are told to give that person the number. Right? Everyone, no matter how young, how old, how good, 
how bad, how rich, how poor, what ethnicity we are. It says everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. We are all sinners in need of a Savior. We all deserve the wrath of God for our sins. However, if we call on the name of Jesus, there's a promise. A promise to be claimed. God will not view us who we are. He views His Son's blood. It is with our tongues that we can be saved. It's with our tongues that we can be saved. That's the first step. If you're here today and you do not know whether you are uh, going to spend eternity in heaven, spend eternity with your Creator, or spend eternity separated from Him, I urge you, like, let's talk. Let's make that decision today. Let's make it today. Ask Him to take away your sins. Confess that He is King of kings and Lord of lords. Make Him the the King and the, the Savior of your life today. Time is short. Time is very short. Life is but a vapor, but eternity is forever. If you're here today and you call yourself a Christ follower, I ask you, what are your feet looking like? Your, does, your, does your car look like uh, really clean and pristine all the time? No bugs on the windshield. No uh, no dirt in the, the floor mats, right? It's really clean. You, you never have to, you never drive it. It just sits there. Are you taking the gospel to the end of the earth? Or are you a secret Christian? I'm going to plead with you. I plead with you. Please, make a decision today. Make a decision today. 